Good morning. My name is Jonathan Sigmund, and I have a confession to make you, to you all this morning. I am a stingy person. Started out when I was a wee little lad, about yay tall, and I had my piggy bank, and my pennies were for me, for myself, and I. I did not give, share any of my pennies with any of my friends. And then I got to high school, and I ended up taking woodshop class three different years in a row, not because I failed, and not because I am handy in any way at all, but so that I could make birdhouses during school and sell them on eBay <laughs> for a large profit I may add. And then uh, I graduated college and I got a job at a local coffee joint known as Starbucks. And uh, part of the benefits that, that you receive if you work there is you get a pound of coffee every single week. And so I worked there for almost two years, and by the end of my time there working at Starbucks, I had accrued and accumulated over 50 or 60 pounds worth of coffee. And it was all for me. <laughs> I did not share with my friends and family. It's a low moment for me. <laughs> and so I move up here to New York uh, to marry a girl and to start working here at the church. And uh, I'm moving in all this coffee, and my cupboards are filled, and that is where my father-in-law began to call me Mr. Cheapo. <laughs> and he said, Scrawny Sig shares none of his coffee with me. And some of those things were true. My name is Jonathan. I have a confession. I am a stingy person. This is where you say, good morning, Jonathan. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, of course, I've had these, these moments in my life where I'm not so proud of, where um, I, I did cling on to what was mine, what was given to me, or what I had earned. And I was not a real giving-oriented person. I was focused more on myself than making sacrifices for those that were around me. So... My question for every single one of us today that we're going to explore is, why would you ever give up anything that is rightfully yours? It's your right. You're entitled to it. You've earned it. You've worked hard for it. Or, or maybe this is the question, why would you ever give up time to serve someone who could never benefit you in any way back? Or, or give money to people who you know are, are never going to give anything back in return? Or... Why, what about giving up your time to people who actually offend you? To serve people whose lives are so different than yours, their, their value system is entirely different, that you would give up your time for them? Or, or how about for, for those people that made those decisions that got them there that I would never make? Why would I ever spend my time or my money or my energy to help out those people? They have gotten what they deserved. So for you, what, what's worth sacrificing for you? What's worth sacrificing for the, for the good things in your life, for, for friends, for family, for uh, your job or for your spouse or for your church or for your whole community? And the biggest question of all is why would you ever give up something, anything that is rightfully yours? Well, today we're going to explore a passage in Scripture that has a, a really interesting answer to this, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it, or that is my hope and prayer for this morning. So we just go to the Lord with me as we start this morning? Lord Jesus, I just pray uh, that your presence would be here with us. We already know that where two or more gather, you are there. And so we just want to welcome you into this place. We want your word to move forward. Would you stir up our hearts and our lives to become more and more like you May your word move forward in our lives. In your name, amen. Amen. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, open up your Bible if you have one. There's one in the seat in front of you, or it's going to be on the screen. Um, we're picking up at 1 Corinthians 9 today. We've been doing a series of teachings called Countercultural Church, and we've been doing a chapter every single week. And so if you're wondering what's going to be preached on next week, it's going to be 1 Corinthians 10, if you're doing math right there. And actually... Um, 
next week, to, to give you a little teaser, um, one of my good friends and favorite preachers on the planet, Dave Hurtwick, is going to be here, um, so you're definitely not going to want to miss that. But before we can jump into the text on 1 Corinthians 9, is, is really chapter 8 flows into chapter 9, which actually flows into chapter 10. So if you don't take some time to kind of figure out what's happening and what's being said, it, it could get kind of confusing for us. So I had always heard 1 Corinthians 9, or I'd only heard one message on it ever that I could remember. And the, the biggest takeaway I remembered was that pastors should be compensated for the work that they do. I was like, no wonder Pastor Bob went on vacation this week. He wants me to get up there and say that. Of course he goes on vacay that week. It's for his anniversary or something. I don't know. Um, I, I don't know. <laughs> I got to check into that. But um, here's what I came come to find out is that that actually isn't the point or the purpose of this passage. Paul does talk about, he says, hey, I'm out here working, I'm planting churches, I'm uh, helping write these letters, keep churches healthy, that's what I'm doing. I have a right to get my food and my drink. Like, basically, you should be taking care of me. But here's what he says in verse 15. He said, but I have not used any of these rights. And I'm not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. His whole point and his whole purpose is not about what I thought it was about. <laughs> Praise the Lord, so I don't have to preach on that. But um, So what is, the, what is the point of this whole passage? Well, we're going to pick up at verse 19, and we're going to figure this out together. Here's what Paul writes to the Corinth church. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. I want to just pause for a second. Just underline that phrase, to win as many as possible, is a big point that Paul is, is going to talk about here. Paul says, to the Jews I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one who was under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those who are under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, Though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. If you're a little lost because I just said the word law 600 times, we're going to break this down together. Don't worry. Paul says, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. And here's where it's all building up to for Paul. He says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. You see, the point of this passage is all about giving up our rights and our preferences for the most important thing. It's all one big culmination. It's all for the sake of the gospel. Paul says, I've got the right to be compensated for the work that I do. And that's, that's good, that's biblical, that's fine. But I would lay all of that aside. That's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that somebody could come to understand the goodness of who Jesus is. All of my life, not just this section, not just Sunday morning, but everything of my life is all, all, all for the sake of the gospel. So let's break this passage down a little bit. We're going to go to verse 19. It says this. Paul says, I'm free, completely free, but I've made myself a slave to everyone. See, Paul doesn't just give up his right at his money that he's earned. Instead, he says, I'm going to set aside my personal preferences, my religious rights, everything about uh, what I want, when I want it. It's not about that. Instead, it's about Jesus. And the purpose is to win as many as possible. Now, when we think about winning, we usually think about the person that's the fastest or, or wins the race or is the strongest, or maybe it might even in a context be that has the most or something like that. But, but what is the biblical definition of winning? It's actually much different. It's to sacrifice what I want so that somebody else can be introduced to the grace of Jesus, that someone else could experience life in him. It's to sacrifice what I want, when I want it, so somebody else could experience joy in Christ. And so, so why, would, why would Paul say this? Why would Paul say, this is, all, this is all what my life is for? This is entirely what I'm giving everything for. And this is because Paul believed 
If someone could meet Jesus, absolutely everything in their life could be transformed. Not just like some, some little things made a little bit better, but everything about them could be transformed. In fact, that's what Paul had experienced in his own life. You read about this in the book of Acts, where he has this in, incredible transformation from being this antagonistic person towards these new followers of Jesus to meeting God and his whole life being entirely transformed, completely turned upside down to where he became the most, the most passionate, devoted follower in his time. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament because of what God did in his life. And here's the other thing is, the, the very disciples who walked around with Jesus for three years, seeing him perform his miracles, seeing him do his work, all of them, with, with the exception of Judas who betrayed him, every single one of them gave up their physical lives for the sake of Jesus. They died for the cause of Christ. And their reason was that they had seen and they had believed and they had heard and they said, you know what? It is worth it. It is worth it because of what Jesus has already done for me. It's my response to him. So what does that mean for us? Well, we're, we're probably not in a situation where, where we're looking to uh, have our lives physically taken for Christ. Or I, I pray that isn't the, the case for any of us here. But but what is it in our context here? I think what it means is that we are called to set aside our rights, our preferences, our privileges for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of others, for the sake of them being able to understand, fully comprehend, and accept Jesus' love for them. It's to win as many as possible. It's our purpose as followers of Jesus. So... Keith was really excited for me to be able to share his story with you all this morning, and I'm excited as well. So Keith uh, is, is an adult who lives right here in Rochester, and he's working and, and uh, doing really well, uh, doing very successful at his business that he's working at. And, but Keith started drinking a little bit on the weekends, and then that turned, after several months and years, turned to drinking on the weeknights until alcohol had really grabbed captive and grabbed a hold of his life and into the place where he would describe himself as an alcoholic. He was, he was ruining his relationships, uh, his relationship with his wife, with his kids, with his friends, was even at risk of losing his job and, and, and family relationships as well because of what was happening in his life. And, and this is where, when, when everybody else started to kind of pull away and, and disengage from Keith and, and everything that was going on in his life because of the decisions he was making, his friend Mark started moving in and moving towards him in his point where he was really, really low and feeling really discouraged and disconnected. And so Mark and Keith had been uh, buddies back in high school, but they hadn't really hung out too much since. Um, but Mark became aware of his situation. So Mark is a, a longtime follower of Jesus, and, and he goes to church right here at Calvary. And he said, you know what, I'm going I'm to move in, I'm going to move towards my friend here. And so he starts uh, spending his weekends with him and, and spending even his weeknights with him. And, and they start going out and they're just, you know, eating wings and having a good time. But they also say, you know what, I'm, we're, we're going to set aside the beers. We're, we're, gonna, we're not going to do that anymore. And so um, Keith's just starting to develop some better friendships and better relationships when Mark says, you know what, you got to come check out my church. It was very just natural progression. They had been hanging out anyways, and uh, Keith knew that Mark was real involved at his church. He said, okay, I'll check it out. So Mark comes in, or uh, sorry, Keith comes in rather one day, and uh, he checks it out, and he's like, oh my goodness, this music is awesome. And he loves it. And he says, these people are so joyful and they're so welcoming and loving. And he says, I love this. And then he says, man, those messages are so good. Note he's referencing Pastor Bob, not myself. Um, but he says, man, this place is amazing. And he loves it. And so he comes back a few more weeks until he gets to this place where God works on his heart and works on his life. And he says yes to Jesus. Can we just celebrate God and his work and his life? I think that's worth celebrating. 
And, and here's the story of Keith now. So Keith is, has been free from alcohol now for several months. Um, he has been starting to restore relationships. In fact, I was talking to him this week, and he's like, he's like, make sure, Jonathan, you say to them. He said, tell everybody, the week starts on Sunday, not on Monday now. I said, okay, I like that. So, um, you know, for, for, it was just, it's just a great story of God working in, in Keith's life. But the point of that story is actually that Mark had to make some significant, significant sacrifices for that to be able to come true. Mark was giving up his weeknights, and, and Mark has his own family. He's got his wife and his kids, and, and he didn't neglect them or anything like that. But, but he gave up his free time to just watch Netflix and binge watch, and he said, you know what, I'm going to invest in my friend, invest in this relationship. It is worth it. And now to see what God is doing in Keith's life, Mark would tell you all day long that was worth all six of those weeks uh, going out and, and doing those things and all the baggy eyes and being tired because he stayed up too late talking. He said, it's all worth it. And here's what's even cooler. I just got to add this in is Keith is now uh, talked with me this week and he's met a young man who is struggling with the exact same things he has been struggling with. And Keith has said, hey, you know what? I'm going to start investing in this young man. Jonathan, let's do this together. Let's, let's walk this out. And so I'm excited about what God is going to continue to do through Keith's life. Amen? Amen. Amen. So this is what I think Paul would define as winning that I might win some for the sake of the gospel. For, for Paul, it's his whole motivation of what he's after. It's all about Jesus. It's not Jesus plus I can have this really awesome family. It's not Jesus plus I can have the really big house. It's not Jesus plus I can get the good car because I'm going to get blessed by God. Which, by the way, you want to know how sad my life is? I'm saving for a minivan right now. <laughs> Can we, just, can we just all just pray for me real quick or something? Um, so, but, but Paul's point is, it's, it's, it's not Jesus plus all the good things. It's not Jesus plus good health. Jesus plus good community. It's, these are all good things. These are all blessings from God. They're all great things. But that is not the main thing. It is not the thing that Jesus came back for. Jesus came back for us for our souls to rescue us when we need rescued. Our motivation is all for the sake of the gospel. It's all for the sake of loving God and loving people. That's our motivation. And I don't know about you, but at the end of my life, I want to be the kind of person who can say, I did it all for the sake of the gospel. If you want to live a life like that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Now, Paul drives his point of this home even further um, as we read on in this passage together. It's with this, with this really cool illustration um, that I really like. Um, so if you pick up with me at verse 24, Paul writes, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer who's just like beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul's point here is, I'm not doing this so that I can boast, so that I can get attention. It's not a literal blow to my body. He's saying this is all for the sake of the gospel. Now, I want you to think about um, athletes, and specifically Olympic athletes, and all that they do to sacrifice to get to the place that they are. Now, for me, um, I don't know about you guys, but when, especially when Summer Olympics come on, I just get, like, straight up hyped to be an American. I'm, like, red, white, and blue for three weeks straight. I'm, I'm just gung-ho. I'm screaming at the TV as if it makes a difference, and I, I'm, just, I'm just all in. I just get so prideful to be an American, especially for the underdog, especially beach volleyball. That, that's some good stuff. But, um, so, but think about those athletes. They they, they give up so much along so many years. I, I think of the stories of like the, those young little gymnasts who start at like three years old and work their whole lives to get to this moment. And it's so much pressure and, and everything. But they, they sacrifice 
so much along the way. Many of them, they um, will train and work away from their family for months at a time. Their school schedule doesn't look like the rest of our school schedules looked. And they aren't allowed to eat bacon, cheddar, cheeseburgers, and ice cream like I so love. Pastor Bob says ice cream is a vitamin, so maybe they can do that. I don't know. But they, they give up so, 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 so much for what... Uh, they are going after for their prize of, of winning that Olympic gold medal or being an Olympic um, competitor. Now, the location of this letter, like I said, is being written to the people in Corinth. And in Corinth at that time was the location of the Isthmian Games. And the Isthmian Games were a big deal back then. It's kind of like our Olympics where they'd get all the best competitors together. They'd compete, they'd run, they'd do all sorts of different um, competitions. And so this message is carrying all the more weight when, he's, when he starts talking about this analogy about running. Um, they, they would really, really understand this. But Paul says this, he says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? It's like, well, well duh, Every, everybody understands that's what happens in a race. And Paul's point is that it should be just as equally obvious to every single one of us who follow Jesus as to our purpose in our life. We should be pursuing a prize that is eternal, that never fades, that's imperishable, that changes lives. Olympians do it for a gold medal. We do it for the sake of the gospel. Amen? Just like, just like Olympians give up all those normal pleasures that, that we get to enjoy throughout all of our life, they give that up, they train so hard, they work so hard, we as followers of Jesus are being called to live a similar sacrificial life for Christ. Now, Paul is talking about how incomparable it is to compare what an athlete wins to what is at stake for the gospel. The athletes um, who were competing for a prize, you know, of course, you, you got to get a prize at the end of uh, running, you know, a race or something like that. Like, that's, you got you to get your pride, but you also need to get your prize uh, for sure. So uh, the, the Olympians, or, or they're, you know, I don't know what they were called back then, but they were competing in the Isthmian Games. When they would win uh, at their competition, they would get a crown. And this crown was made of pine cones or celery and I don't know about you all but I'm not running a race to try to get some celery if I if I'm running a race I better get a whole lot more than that the celery doesn't even have peanut butter on it so why do you even want it I mean it doesn't even make any sense and Paul is just making this contrast so stark here he's saying what a joke the prizes of this world really are compared to the prize of Jesus. What a joke. And now for us, of course, we're, we're not going to make that uh, sacrifice for celery, likely, in our life. But what are the things in our lives that just consume too much of our mental energy, too much of our time, that, that just become too elevated in our lives? They, 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 something, it's, it's like this. It's, it's like when, when God gives us these good things, and we, we start to elevate them too high, they become in a place that, that either become equal to God or greater than God. And it's, it's usually not like, it's not usually like the bad things in our life, like alcohol, that can happen too. But often for us, it's actually the good things, the gifts that God has given to us. It can be things like our family that we can start to say, that is the prize. I do everything so that my family can live this great life and, or, or it's about my opportunities for my kids and what they get to do and what they get to experience. Or it's about my job and how I can give it all. And, it, and it's a good God-honoring thing to love your family, to, to honor them, to provide for them, and to do everything you can at your workplace to live with excellence. Those are all God-honoring biblical things. But if they ever get elevated to a point that is above God... They now can't withhold that pressure. That now has become an idol. That has become our crown of celery. That it's elevated too high in our lives. We begin to make sacrifices for the things that are, we, we, that are elevated above God. And that's where our lives begin to become disoriented. Because 
I, I, we can't, th- uh, those things can't live up to that pressure. Our family can't live up to that pressure. If we find our identity in our jobs, we're gonna, and when we lose that job, or when it comes to an end, we lose our identity. Our identity has to be found in Christ. And when we're making our sacrifices, we've got to know what we're aiming after, what we are going after. It's got to be about Jesus. It's got to be about Jesus. And we've got to be willing to let go of and sacrifice even the things that we hold tightest to. We've got to let go of that grip. So maybe for you this morning, you're sitting there thinking, well, how do I lead a life of sacrifice? I definitely do that sometimes. I'm, I'm pretty good at it in this area and this area. But, you know, I, you know, I don't know if I'm doing that all the time or doing that really well. Well, in Keith's story, you remember, I talked about Mark and the important part that he played in his role in coming to understand Christ and the sacrifice that Mark made. And Mark had to make some great sacrifices, and I think God calls us to that. But the hero of that story was not Mark. It wasn't Keith. The hero of that story is Jesus. You see, Jesus is the one who already made the sacrifice for every single one of us on that cross. He's the one who already bled in our place. And he is the one who can take dry bones and bring them back to life. He could take a heart of stone and melt it because he is the Savior. He will help. There is, there is not a limit to the goodness of God. If you want to lead a life of sacrifice Look and turn to Jesus. Radical heart change happens for each and every one of us when we place our, Christ in, our faith in Jesus Christ. If we start to place our faith in anything else, it just won't last. If you want to, if you want to lead a life that uh, is more sacrificial... If you want to do this longer than next Tuesday, you're going to have to point to Jesus. You're going to have to look to Jesus, fall more in love with him than with the things of this world, where that's where you're pointing, that's where you're aiming, that's where your sacrifice is for. It's for him. It's for the sake of the gospel, and it's your response to him and what he has already done for you. Amen? Amen. And it's it's really, it's not that hard. It's it's not as abstract as you might think. It's it's really praying a prayer and saying, Jesus, I, I need you to realign and repurpose my priorities. I need you to be number one, and I need these other things to be number two, three, four, and five. But you've got to be my ultimate pursuit. And if you want that to be your story, you you just start with that that simple prayer. And here's the thing about Jesus is he doesn't leave our prayers unanswered. And they often don't happen as quick or in the way that we want, but he's going to respond because he is faithful. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now, I talked earlier about how I'm prone to stinginess and prone to uh, keeping some things to myself. Uh, But there was this one time that I actually got it right, and and a lot of that was in large part due to my wife. Um, So so my wife and I had been saving up a a bunch of money, actually, for uh, like three years or so. And, um, you know, making sacrifices all along the way so that we could um, go on a really nice vacation together. We had gone on our honeymoon to Bermuda, and we really wanted to go back there because Bermuda is awesome. I saw a young kid, like, running around with a Bermuda shirt on today. If it would have been my size, I might have <laughs> tried to take it from him. Just kidding. That's, that's really weird. Um, <laughs> probably shouldn't have said that. Um, <laughs> story of my life, actually. Um, next week, we're going to talk about your tongue and how you should have control. Um, no. um, okay, so, um, so we're saving up this money to be able to go to Bermuda. We're really excited. We're making these sacrifices. And these missionaries come through here at Calvary, talk right here, and they say, hey, here's what God is calling us to. Here's what he's leading us to. We're really excited about this opportunity. And it like stirs and moves my heart and I's, uh, our hearts um, of my wife and I. And we're just thinking like, man, I, I don't know. Like maybe we're supposed to do something different with this money. So we start praying about it and we really feel led like, hey, um, we need to make this sacrifice. And so we set up an appointment with the missionaries. We get some ice cream together out in Greece because you can't have a meeting without ice cream. And we get together and we start talking and we say, hey, We've been saving up this money. We're so excited about what the mission God has called you to. Here is a big old check, at least for us, of what we're going to give to you. 
And they're like, wow, this is so nice. This is so great. This is so generous of you. And we're like, yeah, feeling great. And uh, so, not really. It wasn't like a prideful thing. It just, you know, we had given. And so we, we felt really great about it. But then they said to us, they said, they said, actually, you know what? We're not looking for your money. We want you to go. And we said, come again? We said, what? We were not thinking that was what their response was going to be. Don't all missionaries, don't you guys just need some more money? They said, yes, we do, and we're raising a bunch, but you know, we need uh, people to come and see the work that God is doing, and we want you guys to become a part of it. Oh boy. So we, we go back to praying, and, and the Lord leads us to do it. We have this amazing trip, and uh, we, we go over to Bangladesh, which is where the missionaries are located and doing their work. And we get to see firsthand, um, in, in the midst of so much darkness, these rays of hope and light bursting through uh, with Christ. And so, uh, you know, so we, we have a great trip. And it, it certainly was not the same trip as our Bermuda trip. That is, that is a fact. Going to a third world country was, was not similar, really, in any way. Except that um, when we came back, we were really amped up. And we were focused on what really mattered. And for my wife and I at that time, we needed kind of this like spiritual shot in the arm. And, and God really gave that to us at that time. And that's, that's not to say that, like, hey, you should never save up and go on vacation. That would be very hypocritical of me because I'm leaving this Saturday to go to the Adirondacks. Um, so don't call me next week. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but no, but, it, but the point is not that we can't go on vacation. The point is that uh, to, to make a sacrifice for Jesus was really, really worth it. Because here's what ended up happening as a result of that. We came back, we told you all the story of what God was doing in Bangladesh, and then you all got fired up about it. And then together we have all been able to make sacrifices together and been able to raise over $40,000 to send to these girls, to these young girls who w would have been prone or could have been exposed to a life of prostitution, now are set free, now don't have to be exposed to that level of darkness, instead have have been rescued, they have a safe home, they have their education, they have their meals, if they stay with the program, they're getting their college paid for, all of this because of the sacrifice we have made together, amen, that is worth celebrating, I think that is awesome, and that, that trip was one of the best things that could have happened for our marriage as well, and here's what I didn't realize, is that that, that level of sacrifice, I just kind of thought like, okay, it's something like I'm feeling called to do and like I need to do and so I need to release that. But really that sacrifice opened up this incredible amount of joy that came into my life. And I didn't see that coming, to be quite honest. I didn't know that was what was going to follow, was that sacrifice could actually result in incredible joy. It's been, there's been nothing like watching what has happened over the last four years for these young girls, for us together as a church community. And that's what a life of faith is. A life of faith is not boring, just like, you know, I bring my Bible to church once in a while and I'm, I'm you know, I'm stoic, I don't do anything. No, it's, it's about a life of adventure. It's a, a life of faith is a life that pursues the wonder of God, that, that you, could ex you could have direct connection to the creator of the universe who also knows you so well, the good, the bad, and the super ugly parts of you, that he would still love you the same. That he knows the number of hairs on your head, and he still loves you the same. He, he, he knows, and some of you got more hairs than others. <laughs> That's, we're not judging. That's all good. But here's the thing. God loves you so, so much. And I, I, just, I didn't know that sacrifice could result in so much joy, and seeing that joy for our whole community and for those girls over there. But the other side of sacrifice that I think that doesn't get talked about as much is that sacrifice is joy-filled, but sacrifice is also incredibly risky. And this is the part that we as preachers don't want to talk about. You know, we, we like to talk about faith in Christ results in new life and being transformed and being rebirthed, and all of that is true. That's 100% the story. But here's the other thing about sacrifice and what God calls us to as a result of that decision is often a whole lot more. You see, the people in Corinth who are receiving this letter are hearing this as if, hey, sacrifice for me could mean that I give up my physical life for Jesus. I could literally die for this cause. And I believe that it's worth it 
because of what Jesus has done for me. So, so maybe for you today, it's, it's not that Christ is, it, you know, God is calling you to that, and, and that's not at all what I'm encouraging. But I'm just saying the magnitude of the sacrifice is so much greater often than we start to think about it um, in, in our terms here. Paul says, everything I do is for the sake of the gospel that I might win some. So sacrifice is risky, but Jesus is worth it. He made that ultimate sacrifice for you, and he is inviting each of us to lead a life of sacrifice for him. Amen? Amen. Would you just bow your heads today? We're going to take some moments to reflect, moments to think on this. Because I believe that God is calling each of us to live countercultural lives, to, to something higher, to something so much more, to something so much greater. So, Which of your rights, of your preferences, or your privileges do you need to give up for the sake of the gospel? Where do you need to make a sacrifice? Where is God calling you to do that? Is is there a relationship you feel called to invest in in your life? I really felt somebody tugging on my heart this week as, as I thought about this that I know I need to make some time for. Or... Or is it your time? Do you need to sacrifice something you love for something you love even more? Do you want to start using your time to uh, give, give more to church or, or more to your community or whatever that looks like for you in, in your time investment for others? Or maybe even on a time front, maybe it's just time spent with Jesus, falling more in love with him, that my time isn't just about me, and mine, but my time is the Lord's because all I have is his. And maybe that starts to develop a deeper connection and a healthier relationship between you and Christ. Or maybe for you, honestly, it's, it is your money. It is your resources financially that you've been giving. I, I know that's what God has had to challenge me on over and over and over again in my life, to be faithful. And it's, you know, honestly, it's, it's why I moved to a place practically where I said, I'm going to sign up for just online recurring giving. I'm going to take 10% out, and I'm just going to give it straight to God right out the top. I want to be faithful to him. He has been faithful to me. I'm not going to wait to be emotionally moved by a presentation. Instead, I'm just going to act in obedience. My generosity is about obedience. It's not just about my emotions. And, And I've been able to see how that sacrifice has been able to impact so many people here in Rochester and and around the world. Or or maybe the thing that you're being called to sacrifice is actually the good things in your life and to reprioritize, to put them back in order to how God would have them, to put Jesus number one, to ask Jesus to realign your heart. I don't know what the Lord is telling you, but I do know that the Lord wants to tell you something. He's a relational God. So we're just going to take a minute. I'm going to stop talking, and I'm going to encourage you just to talk to Jesus, just like you would talk to someone else. And I also want to encourage you to listen. Listen to what he's saying. What is he calling you to sacrifice today? Let's continue to press into the Lord. Let's stand together. Let's sing this out.